Hey everyone, this is Mike Andes and you're listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Today we are going to be talking about something that I don't think is talked about enough when it comes to hiring, creating a team, and really what it takes for you as the business owner to do so. Today I'm not behind my studio mic, I just have a, a, a mic, I, just a handheld one that I have out in the field all the time with me. I wanted to share this with you as, that, as it kind of came to me. I jotted some notes down and I want to share this with you because I feel it's very important. Something I've been dealing with as I have been juggling a couple different companies and trying to build the team that we uh, hire. And so before we jump into that though, big thank you to today's sponsor, which is cashflowtool.com. If you haven't already, go to cashflowtool.com slash bootcamp. And this tool, if you have QuickBooks, so if you have QuickBooks and you use that as your accounting software, you send invoices through QuickBooks, or you run payroll through QuickBooks, it's an integration that uses QuickBooks and basically allows you to see and forecast your cash flow for the whole year, for the whole month, and know exactly when you need to be preparing for low times, when you need to be preparing for times when cash isn't going to be coming in as as frequently. So for instance, if you have a, a, a monthly billing cycle, you need to be able to make sure you have money in, on the 20th and the 25th when payroll comes around and yet you're billing people on the 30th and the 31st. And so definitely check this out if you have any sort of rise and fall in your cash flow. If you have periods of net 30 or net 60 where people are paying you you know, a month or two months after you've performed service, this is definitely something you want to look into. Cashflowtool.com slash bootcamp is going to get you a discount on their monthly price as well as a free trial. So check it out today. Go to cashflowtool.com slash bootcamp. Now today, I'm going to be talking about something just kind of off the cuff that I've been thinking about and then also experiencing as I've been running my company. And then as I, I talked about a couple episodes ago, I've been uh, we're in the process of taking over uh, a gym, local gym, and so in doing so, uh, there, you know, there's differences in culture. There's differences in you know who is the existing team and how do we, you know, really change that culture to really fit how I'm going to run the company. And so, you know, this particular you know company that I'm buying has really been you know, ran by an owner operator. However, that owner operator has seven other gyms and has not been able to be at this particular facility for a long time. Like literally once or twice a month, they have been checking in with the staff. And so really they've been left kind of on an island themselves. And because of that, the culture has been really broken down. And so I think it's a kind of a warning sign to those of us who have multiple locations or have multiple business ventures is to make sure that our people don't feel like they are isolated or, you know, with technology the way it is now, there's really no excuse not to have team meetings and stay in communication. Like it's not necessarily that you need to have physical presence within all of your organizations or your offices or whatever it is. It's more or less that your presence is known regardless of whether or not your physical body is there. So whether that be communicating via text message, video conferences, uh, team meetings over the phone even, whatever it is to make sure that your presence and your per- pers- your persona is being carried out within the team, like it really starts from the top. And so if you're, the way that you see an organization running is not being translated to the rest of your team, many times a, c- a breakdown of communication. And so really as I step into this organization and we, we're trying to turn the b- company around and we're going to be taking ownership, of it, it's, it's it's a really unique position because since I did work there and I know the owner very well, uh, I, I've already had a lot of contact with the existing employees and the team there, and already had a lot of their ideas of how what we're going to change and be able to implement and improve. But it's interesting when you go into a company like that that hasn't had the direct impact of the owner, the founder there, and see a staff that is floundering, a culture that has real no basis, no foundation. And really has been built upon uh, really just mo- people that people that feel like they have no support and that their voice isn't being heard. And so as I go into this company, or, and I I hope that this is just really just a sounding board, something that everyone out there is can take caution to is if you have a company, make sure that you are within you're, you're, you have the heartbeat of the company, regardless of whether or not you're there every day, regardless of whether or not you talk to all your people physically and know them all by name or whatever it is. But that it's important that you know the heartbeat of the company, what's going on, whether it be financially, whether it be internally, and more important, the culture of the of the company. Uh, and so as we go into this this new venture, 
seeing who we're going to keep, who we're going to have to uh, find, you know, basically lay off or they're not going to work well for the team. Like, how do they fit in to the team? Are they going to work with our culture? And so as I go into this organization, we make sure that we really make it clear what the changes are going to be, how the culture is going to change. And for some people, when you do that, if you're thinking about buying a company, they will leave because they literally have been uh, perhaps just sort of lulled to sleep or gotten used to the culture before or how things were done in the past or what their expectations were of them, what the expectations of them were in the past. And you might not be able to turn the company around with them on board. And so there are definitely, you know, conversations of, you know, who should we be keeping, who should, uh, you know, who's not going to adapt to this new culture, because there's always an advantage of being able to train someone from from the ground up. And so whether it be in our landscaping company or now the gym or you know every every industry there's always pros and cons to hiring people that have already have experience and in this case when you're buying a company uh, it's very you, you don't want to rock the boat too much cuz customers or uh, other staff members can get a little bit uh, nervous if you start all of a sudden going in their guns a blazing firing everyone. However, on the other hand, it, you have to make it very clear that from the onset of of taking the company over or starting a business that your culture is number one and anyone that doesn't align with that culture will be cut. And so we really look at, as I've, as I've said before, as a team, we are in a family, a family you love unconditionally, whereas a team, you can get cut. And so when you go into a new, new company and you're taking over, it's, it's, it's a very fine line, as I've found in the past few weeks, of walking in and you don't want to disturb them too much. You don't want to rock the boat too much. You want to almost put the front of, you know, nothing's going to change in one regard. And then on the other hand, make it very clear that there's going to be definite changes because you really want to scare away the people that aren't going to work well with your culture. And so I really truly believe that the number one ingredient of an entrepreneur as you build a team, you build your company and you hire more people is empathy how empathetic the entrepreneur is at the top of the organization is so important and the reason the reason i think this is so often overlooked is caring is not it, it's just not on the it's not on the pnl you don't see it in the profit and loss statement you don't see it in your bank statement caring is not a line item in most people's annual report or anything like that but caring Caring for your people, caring for your culture, caring for your customers, but most importantly, to caring for your, the people that work for you is so important, and it's really an indicator of what the strategy of an entrepreneur is, whether it be short term or long term. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the short term, you know, a, a, an organization or an entrepreneur that is bottom line focused or uh, trying to get the most out of people without giving anything in return. That sort of an organization is thinking short term, they're not going to keep their people, there's going to be a higher turnover, uh, there's going to be, you know, short term, they might get results by using positional authority. So you know, saying that they're the boss, or I'm their, I'm your manager, you have to do what I say, or you're going to lose your job, like using positional authority, those are a really good indicator of what the, the entrepreneur is thinking, whether it be, are they running this company for the short term profit for the, you know, one, two, three years and then flip the business or one, two, three years and then the business tanks or are they running it for the long term? Because caring isn't on the P&L. However, it is a direct correlation to the long-term success of a business. An entrepreneur that has empathy has a long-term vision because they have their people focused and they. I truly believe that a true entrepreneur has empathy and is a team player. And by doing so, they have a long-term vision for what the company can do because they, they realize that adding caring to the profit and loss statement is going to affect the bottom line. It is going to take money. It is going to take time. It's going to take energy. You will sacrifice short-term dollars for long-term empathy if that is something that is important to you, but it will pay for itself dividends. It might be five. It might be 10. It might be 15. It might be 20 years down the road when that employee that used to work for you comes back and is joins your team again after getting experience outside of your field. But yet because you were an empathetic entrepreneur and someone that they could uh, trust and that you cared for them, they come back to you and it might have been 20 years later after that time that you spent the time and the money and the energy and the extra effort to add that caring aspect, that empathy to their workplace and then it pays dividends. And that's the real bottom line of a, a quote unquote boss or employer that's thinking in the long term, they will focus more on their people than just the bottom line. 
And the reason for that, and you look at organizations that get through economic crises or downturns in an economy or in their industry, it's the ones that have created a team and a culture that is going to stick through the hard times. When the times get tough, when things get start, you know, go through a recession like 2005, 2008, right in through there, you start seeing the companies that failed. It was companies that were thinking short term, that were bottom line focused, that were trying to squeeze the dollars out of every single transaction without looking at the, their people and seeing how can they inject empathy and caring into their business model, their entire structure of the company to make sure those people don't leave. Those people, when times get tough, they're willing to take a pay cut to make sure the company stays on its feet. Those are the the, the long-term benefits to the short-term losses of being an empathetic entrepreneur. And, you know, as I take over the, the gym, you know, how you know i really look at them i really look at these the these employees the team that's there the culture and and, and you know, when you start thinking about you know how do we change the culture you look at you know employees that are overworked and undersupported and that is a recipe for disaster and this is the this is the things about so many people there are some employees that will literally stick with you through year after year after year who are overworked undersupported maybe even underpaid uh undervalued and and this is a recipe for disaster of turnover and uncommitted employees, people that aren't willing to go the extra mile, that aren't willing to do anything beyond what their job description says. But it's also it's also very sad for an employee that is stuck in that position and goes years and years and years. The, the reason I'm talking about this is because I've had conversation with these employees that have been in this situation and to see the relief over their faces to realize that the level of how much I care about the team is going to trump the the bottom line and how much we look at the profit and loss. Because I genuinely believe that it does pay long-term benefits. And I do believe the bottom line is affected by the level of caring of the entrepreneur. I truly believe that. But it's a lagging indicator and it's a long-term play for you as the employer. And so whether it be compensation or uh, you know, the biggest thing for as, as I'm you know, realizing in the past couple of weeks as I'm talking to the existing employees is, is how do you draw them in? How do you get people to become part of a culture when they for so long have been overworked, undersupported, their ideas haven't been listened to? And I feel like you know, maybe you have a culture that isn't, isn't the way it should be. Maybe it's not a, a culture that you want to go to work with, a culture that isn't keeping people and retaining them and feeling, making them feel challenged. And when they come to work, the people around them they want to be with, maybe that's not a culture you have. So I'm going to give you three little tidbits of, you know, how do you change it? How do you turn this around? You know, number one, have team meetings. I'm, I am shocked to shocked every single time I have a, a, a conversation with a small business owner and I ask, do you have weekly meetings? Do you have at least monthly meetings? My goodness. Do you have management meetings? Do you have any sort of time when you get all the people that work for you together in one room and talk to them? If you have under 20 or 30 employees, it's imperative that you have weekly meetings. It's imperative that you have an offsite at least once a year to talk to your people, get them on the same page and get the team. On. Like There's a reason why in the NFL and the NBA and the MLB that they practice every single day as a team because when they go out and perform, it shows how much how much they practice together and so if you expect to go out every single day nine to five five six seven days a week and work as a team be out in the field in front of your customers performing for them and you expect that to happen without practice and without team meetings and without culture within an organization you are delusional to think that you're going to be able to perform at the highest level the reason those professional athletes can act the way they do it in the olympics is because they practice year after year after year and then three, four years bef between the Olympics, they still continue to go day in and day out. They work together as a team day in and day out because they know that the more they practice, the more they get together as a team and build their culture, i.e. their skills, their their r rapport with one another, how much they know one another, how much they trust one another, their communication abilities within the team internally, it will show on the rink. It will show on the field. It will show on the court. And the same thing goes for business. 
If you don't have team meetings, if you don't have offsite meetings, if you aren't communicating with your people, if you aren't having one on ones, if you are not having uh, you know times when you go up and you put your arm around someone and talk to them about something outside of business and don't make that connection, if you are not doing that behind the scenes, if you are not doing that in practice when you get out to perform in front of your customers, in front of your competition, in front of your community, you will fall flat on your face at some point in time. Short term, yes, you might make more dollars because you're able to hire people for less or you don't put money into caring and getting them uh, getting your employees things when they need them or caring about them enough to give them something for their family or give them time off. Yes, it might hurt you in the short term, but the long term empathetic entrepreneur will win the long term game. And so team meetings is, in, is super important. That's number 1. Number 2 is individual meetings. You know, team meetings are great because you'll get a lot of ideas from your team and it's great when your team starts to open up and start talking and sharing their ideas of how the company can be be grown uh it's super important like this morning for instance on our team or actually it was yesterday yesterday we had a team meeting uh for our staff and one of the team members there who hasn't said a lot they they you know worked us with us for a few months now uh really said something that was super impactful and i believe like actually kind of like a pivotal moment for our team this year as we've been adding so many more people and really was a gut check for me. It was good for the entire team as a whole, the new employees to hear what he said, the older employees to hear what he said about the the future of the company and his perspective. And it was off the cuff. It wasn't planned. I didn't ask him to talk. He just asked to say something at the end of the meeting. And I believe moments like that are super important in the team meetings. However, there are going to be people within your organization that are introverted, don't want to speak their mind, don't want to say it out loud. And you're going to have have to have individual meetings with those people to draw out of them the gold that can, number one, grow the business, number two, help them and, and, and be able to tailor their compensation to what they need, tailor their schedule to what they need. Those individual meetings are important for those individuals that aren't going to talk out in a team meeting, aren't going to talk out. And, and, and you might say, well, our culture, everyone has to talk out loud or everyone has to be a certain way. You're going to isolate the individuals that aren't that way and you're going to make them feel like they aren't accepted. So make sure you have individual meetings. That's number two. And those individual meetings, talk about their family. Where are they at in their career? Where are they at in their family life? Where are they at physically and mentally? Like think about those things. And as I, as I grow my team, I realize that as I get more and more involved in HR, whether it be hiring, firing, training, but then now as the team has grown, really throughout the day, you're thinking, you know, constantly about where everyone is at, not, not so much just, you know, physically what jobs are they at, what clients are they serving, you know, what clients are they talking to or what sales are they making? It's more about where are they at? Like when they go home, are they okay in their head? Um, you know, as you know, we have so many things going on with our country whether it be opioids or or, or racist, racism things and, and gun control, all these things happening, uh, political stuff going on, but, but within people's families and within their own space, like you have to realize your people don't work but a third of their life, not even if they work eight, 10 hours a day perhaps, they might be working a third, but there's two thirds of their life that you have to care about in order to really win them over. And if you don't, like I said, the short term gains will be there, but the long term, in the long term, they're going to go somewhere else when the times get hard. And so I would recommend to everyone out there, have those individual meetings and connect with your people, ask them what they want out of their job, where can they improve, where, what, how can they get better in their job, and be very open and honest. Ha- ask them for critical feedback towards you how can you be a better leader how can you support them better and make it very clear that you want to be vulnerable that you want to open up that you want to uh, share with them and more important you want them to share with you and give them the platform to uh, ask you for something more to give you some critical feedback it might be the thing that unlocks you to lead your organization better but because if you don't get in the vulnerable position of giving them the platform giving them a, a listening ear at that moment in time that isn't going to shoot them down that is important those individual meetings that's number two number three so team meetings we have individual meetings and this is, we're talking about how do you draw them in how do you draw these employees in how do you make them part of the culture that you want to create number three is important and that's hearing and implementing their ideas if you really want to draw someone into the organization you have to listen number one and number two you have to implement the ideas that work By doing so, they will take ownership of their job. And so often we ask our employees and the people who work for us on our team to be, to take ownership of their job and take ownership of what they're doing and own it. But 
at the end of the day, you own 100% equity in that company. So you have to make sure that you are giving your employees ownership within the company by making sure you implement the ideas they have. And so far, so so many times, small business owners get so proud that we fail to realize that the people in the front lines have the best ideas, the best ways to improve your business. And if you don't listen and you don't implement those ideas, they will realize that the value they're bringing to that organization might be dollars, but it is definitely not in culture, it is definitely not in decision making, but if they see their decisions or or their ideas becoming decisions within the company, their idea of how to improve a system or improve a, a process within the company, and they see that implemented, now they take ownership of that system. They take ownership. They feel like they are a part of the company beyond just dollars and cents, beyond a P&L, beyond just the, the the monetary profit that they give to the company and then the paycheck that they get back in return. They begin to see their blood, sweat, and tears begin to, to materialize in something more than a paycheck. And that is how you build culture. And it's only going to be done by people, entrepreneurs that have the empathy and the humility to care for their people and look past the short-term dollars, energy, time, and, and, and mental strain that it takes to invest now so it shows up on the P&L later, long-term down the road. So you, know, you say, well, how do I turn my culture around? You know, Those team meetings, those individual meetings, hearing and implementing their ideas, those are all important things. And it requires, in my opinion, it really, it really requires buy-in from all parties. And so as you know, I'm getting to the gym and we, we see you know, the culture is pathetic there right now, uh, Great people. There's nothing against the people. It's just how the culture, you know, you know. For instance, you might have great athletes, but if they're not practicing together, if they're not in communication with each other, if they're on different teams, they aren't going to play very well together. One, if they were put on the same team and asked to accomplish a goal, and so that's the reason why practice is important to be with a team before you know preseason and they come up to you know the actual regular season and then the playoffs are at the end but the playoffs those the, those teams have played so much with each other they have gotten so used to communication and interpersonal uh, relations within that team that then they can go perform at high levels and so it really does require buy-in from all parties though when you're trying to turn a culture around uh, and there's going to be friction. So if you if you if you are trying to turn your culture around, there will be friction from some parties, and you you have to evaluate and have really candid conversations with them about where they they fit in on the team and whether or not they're going to create friction going forward, or if they can turn around and become a valuable part of the team. Don't necessarily go against those that right off the bat might have some friction. They might have really good ideas that will uh, kind of change your mind or offer a different perspective. However, realize that if they're going to constantly become becoming just like a stick in the mud for the rest of the team and the progress that you want to make as a culture, you have to cut them fast. So there's that balance there. And um, I just, I just, it's just really fascinating to me as I talk to more and more of you that listen, emails, and those conversations that we have, just how few people, you know, it's so easy to talk about how you care for your people, or you want to build your team, or you love your, you know, love the people that you've hired or whatever. But at the at the end of the day, where you spend your time, where you spend your dollars is screaming to your organization what you care about and if they are on that list of caring. Because if you only care about short-term profit, if you only care about extrapolating you know, value from your people in the short term, it will show up long-term when times get hard. Because people will leave you, they'll leave you for a better job, they will leave you for something else that's easier. It's not always easy to be, you know, every single day of any job is not you know, easy, you know, every single day is not always a dream. There's always times when it gets hard and you have to have people that have bought into the culture, the the mission, uh, what your company's all about beyond just their paycheck. And if you haven't, if you haven't, and you have a culture that's toxic or one that doesn't have caring, I encourage you today to start thinking about how you can add caring to your profit and loss statement. And that might be an expense in the short term. It might be a time when you have to give money away. It might be a time when you have to hire more people so that you can give more of your time to your people, which sometimes is a whole lot more valuable than giving them more money. Is your time and your caring, another meeting with them, a lunch, whatever it is, that might be more important than an extra dollar or two an hour. So I promise you, if you add caring, if you add empathy to your profit and loss statement, the short-term benefits might not be seen, but the long-term results will pay off many, many dividends time and time again. 
You've been listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Andes. Until next time, be great because nothing else pays. <laughs>